So let me remind you what, what was the last thing we had done. I had started Monday by presenting a problem and I ended on Tuesday by saying the solution to the problem existed. So I'm gonna give you a hint of the proof. I mean, actually, we're gonna do the proof to some extent. Um, I'm gonna give you one property of minimizers and then we're gonna change gears and I'll tell you why, okay? I mean, we will use everything we have done. It's not like we're gonna forget everything, but we're gonna change gears um, a little bit. So let me remind you and as I'll make some remarks as I move along. So the, the last thing I had mentioned was the existence of minimizers for the plateau <coughs> And so the, the statement I had given is let E0 in a bit Rn be a set of finite or locally finite parameter, that doesn't matter. I had chosen a ball but as I, it was remarked, we, nothing depends on the ball, okay? Um, <coughs> it, it's any open set, but let's take a ball, okay? So there exists, exist, uh, E, a set of locally finite. Perimeter such that E minus B, and I don't remember if I, no, I think I had to call it B, B ball given. So we only look at the problem size, so coincides with E0 outside and such that, today is not, and such that the perimeter of E is less or equal than the perimeter of any other set F of locally finite perimeter, okay? Such that for every F locally finite perimeter, and I'm gonna fit it here, sorry, such that F minus B is the same thing as E0 minus B. Okay, so a minimizer exists. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to show you the proof. Um, the proof is something that, in this context, the proof is something that convinces you that a minimizer exists. It might be that there are some details that are shoveled under the rug, but don't worry, I'll do it nicely and you won't even notice <laughs> until I point it out. Um, but you know, it's, if we do all the details, it's going to be painful, and it's not. It doesn't illustrate. I mean, there's only one place in the next two days where I'm going to do all the details is to illustrate something I really want to illustrate that is useful not only in this context, but in many other contexts. Okay, so, okay, so we want to minimize. So we're looking for the thing of less perimeter. So let's write what we're talking about. We would like to find, there is a gamma, is the inf of the mu f, so, and I'm gonna draw a picture because in case this notation is getting to you, um, where f set of locally finite perimeter such that f minus b is the same thing as e0 minus b. So what I am doing is I'm looking at, so this is the ball, This is E0, and I am looking at all the other sets F that coins that this is what they look outside and inside. Who knows what they look like, but they look like that. And then, of course, we imagine that this is what the minimizer will look like, but I need to show it exists. Okay? So this is a number. It's greater or equal than zero. And since E0 
is a set of finite parameter or locally finite parameter that satisfies this condition, correct? Therefore, in particular, since, <coughs> let me put a finite parameter, perfect. So since E0 is a competitor, okay, which means is a set in this class, and mu of E0 of Rn, since it's a finite parameter, is finite. It tells me that this number gamma that I'm looking for is finite. Okay, I mean, funny little detail, but not to forget. Okay, so I have a finite number. Is the nth of a bunch of numbers. Therefore, there exists a sequence. So there exists a sequence. E sub h, h, and n. I, why do I write h? Because Francesco Maggi writes h. h is the weirdest uh, <laughs> integer I have met, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's practical because otherwise you write n, and n is the dimension, and then, or, or you write k, and k tends to be a, you know, a subsequence. So H is practical. You don't use it for anything. You just get rid of it in a second, <laughs> but there we go. So there exists. What, what about I? Why not I? I uh, <laughs> you know, I thought I was a really nice thing. <laughs> and I remember, so, uh, parenthesis, okay? Since the other one brings it up, and it actually concerns the two of us. So I learned PDE from Leon Simon, okay? That means I learned all the PDEs I learned, even when they were you know, the elliptic PDEs had a motivation from geometric analysis. So what I was was simply an index or nice index. And I'm teaching PDEs, the topics in PDEs. I'm going to ta uh, teach the Georgie Nash Marshall Zerd, which is a technique that Daniela mentioned. It's a very important technique in PDE. And I am in Seattle, where most people, until this is years ago, had, were only doing inverse problems, where the PDE comes from you take the Fourier transform and then you start, okay, step one. So I write I, and then everybody assume that I was that number such that I squared was one minus one. <laughs> and so <laughs> this has destroyed for me I as a sub-index. <laughs> I wanted to say this was the I derivative. Say, no, you need to put the I in front. <laughs> so, okay, that's why not, okay. <laughs> so, depending on what school you come, I is an okay thing or not, yes. D for dimension would work. Sorry? D for dimension would work. Oh, that's if I were doing a harmonic analysis class. But this is a oh, geometric yeah. measure. Uh, this is, yeah, no, this is a GMT class. D is, no, yes. <laughs> Everything is in window context, okay? So if you go to a harmonic analysis conference, I might put D there, but no, no, not today. <laughs> okay, so we are gonna call it E to H. Plus, look, my handwriting is so bad that the H and the N are roughly the same, so you just choose one. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so there exists a sequence E sub H of in this class, okay, so satisfying these. Satisfying. Start such that the perimeter converges to that called numbered gamma as H goes to infinity, okay? And so what, of course, I want to do is I want to take a, <laughs> I want to, remember we had done a compactness argument before <coughs> first set, so what I want to do is, out of the sequence of sets, produce a set that satisfies what I want, okay? So let me remind you what, what the compactness theorem that did, we did on Tuesday said. If I have a bunch of sequence of sets of finite perimeter, which are included in a large ball, and their perimeters are uniformly bounded, I can get a subsequence. These guys, well, they're not included in a large ball, so we'll have to fix that. And we need to show that their perimeters are uniformly bounded. Okay? So, the only thing we know about these, since they're converging to gamma 
and therefore, you know, I can assume <laughs> that their parameters are going to be less than this parameter, OK? Because, I mean, this is not necessarily the inf, but so I choose sets that have less or equal than that. So I can assume that. Not that gamma, sorry, then the. OK, but so I still, so the parameters are going to be uh, bounded. But how do I put the, what do I do with the ball thing? Yeah. Can you just cut off the outside part of all of this stuff? Can I cut up? Because they all have the same outside. thing outside. And so how do I effectively cut out the, exactly, I mean, I need, how do I cut out that piece? Can you make the, this just like shrink them to the boundary of the ball or something? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we are going to effectively do. So, but you see, that gives us a little, because there comes the, the thing of how much of the measure is going to be bounded here. So I'm going to draw another picture to specify, but that's exactly what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to look at sets we're going to use the fact that the sets are all the same outside. So OK, so that I don't need to touch. I'm going to see what's happening inside. And then we go from there. So let me double check that I need. How many colors do I need? OK, so exactly as was proposed, the idea is I have my ball. I have my set is 0. I'm going to be. Okay, you'll see why. And I have my sets E sub H. So E sub H is going to be same thing out here. And they're going closer and closer to the minimizer, so they must be starting to do something like that, correct? Because we want them to go to the line. OK, so here is what I am going to do. I'm going to consider these sets MH. Which are, which piece did I put first? Sorry, I just want to do it exactly. So is EH symmetric difference E0. Remind you what that is. is E sub H minus E0 union E0 minus E sub H. So these effectively get rid of the outside. So what's E sub H minus E0? So e EH is red. Minus E0 is this piece. And then I have um, E0 minus E sub H. OK. I know I'm not producing the minimizer exactly. I'm going to produce it in a, OK. But so let's think for a minute what's going to happen. What's the advantage of these sets? You wanted sets that were inside the ball, they're inside the ball. What's the perimeter of these sets? Well. I'm going to mu m h of r. And just let's look at the picture. We're going to, I'm going to put a, so the perimeter of this set is this piece and this piece, this piece and this, this and this. Correct? And the thing is that in two dimensions, things appear a little bit. I mean, we cannot see some of the things that could be going wrong. So it looks like, and I claim, this is for sure less than twice mu of the perimeter of E sub H inside the ball plus the perimeter of E0 inside the ball, OK? because we're not going to what happens. <coughs> and so this is for sure 
less than two, I should have read as written this, image rn. It appears like I'm counting twice, but I'm doing that for good measure to make sure that I'm not forgetting anything. OK, I should have put that. OK, so they're bounded because we say this was they're, uni and they're uniformly bounded. So maybe I should say there are four of these. OK, I want to say soup of mu of m of h of rn is less than 4 mu is 0 of rn. So they're uniformly bounded. And now I can apply the theorem. Okay? So the theorem says that I have a sequence of sets of fine. Oh, I didn't say that. They're a finite perimeter. I want to point out something. Set of finite perimeter. We never prove that unions of sets of finite perimeters, set of finite perimeter, intersections of sets of finite perimeter, the set of finite perimeter, the complement of sets of finite perimeter. But I'm sure you can do that. So we're not going to waste time doing that. You can do it. You can believe it. And therefore, I have a sequence of sets of finite perimeter inside a big ball, perimeters bounded. There exists a subsequence that converges. Okay, So there exists kj. You see? H is gone, such that E of, sorry, M of KJ, I'm going to rewrite it, converges to a set M. But that set M, so what's that set M? What we are hoping for <laughs> is that what has happened here somehow is that the rated curve has come straight and we have what we need. How do I reconstruct E, the E that I'm trying to prove exists from M? So let's. Any thought? So the MKJs converge to that. And so. <coughs> let's rewrite A. KJ, let me write it correctly so I don't. I want to rewrite. This is, I'm going to let you convince yourself that I take E0, I put the M KJ, okay, and I remove what I, the extra little piece. This is just set theory. Let me, you know, it's one of these things. And now I'm going to say something that, of course, will require a proof. But if this set of locally finite perimeter converges to M, then this one is going to converge to E0 union M minus E0 intersection M. OK? And I call this guy E. I claim that since that because of our construction, E minus B is the same thing as E0 minus B. I leave it to you to check. I mean, I con we constructed them exactly that way. And by lower semi-continuity, which was something that we had proved, well, no, we had mentioned mu E of Rn is less or equal than the limit of the mu E kj's of Rn. This is a subsequence of something that was converging to gamma. Therefore, this is gamma. So this is a good competitor, somebody who's in the class here. And it achieves the infimum. That's a minimizer. Questions? Um, could you please explain the two of the E and of B? How about we ignore these for a minute and we just put this one over here? And I'm just counting. Let's, let's for a minute simply count 
What's the perimeter? Let's look at the perimeter we see here for this M of H. M of H is the union of the yellow and the orange. Okay? So yellow tells me it's the perimeter is this piece here. So is it appears to be all the piece that of E that of E0 that is inside the ball, and then also the red piece, which is all the piece of the red set which is inside the ball. Okay? But of course this picture is very deceiving because I could have had a piece of the set that is going along the ball. So that's why I put the closure of the ball. And then I do an overestimate. I simply say, look, it's more than the whole perimeter. And that will come from the ball function? The ball, it comes from that and it comes from here, you know. Every time I draw a curve, I'm separating everything and in higher dimensions, things like that don't happen. Okay, so. And I'm being conservative. Okay, I, if I put a two, if it were the case where it's a one, we're happy. I put a two, I'm correct. Okay? Any other questions? No, it depends. No, not necessarily. Okay, because I mean, in this picture, yes, but but in R N, there, there are weird things that happen. Okay, you could have pieces of things that are boundary that end up not separating. You know, th imagine you have tubes that go in, then that starts adding. I guess what I don't understand is then why is two and up and not like five or something? Oh, because you just you don't count. Um, we can talk about it, but it's if it if you need it more, then you will have you can arrange to have a sequence where you don't need much more. Because remember, it's a minimizing sequence. If you are adding too much, then it's a anything else. But see, the two you put because you, you think okay, maybe I go on one side and on the other side. Yeah. Okay. I I just I put the two not to lie. Okay, I'm sure if I had put a one, we would all have been convinced, but I might have been, <laughs> but we might have been lied a tiny bit. One plus epsilon. Yeah, one plus epsilon, okay. Mm -hmm. So, and one plus epsilon in this context is two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you go. You have a proof of the existence of minimizers. You might think this is very satisfying, uh, but in the calculus, you know, on the other hand, you saw that this is a class that admits kind of yucky things. So what everybody asks afterwards is, okay, how nice are these guys? Okay, and lots of the work is spent in trying to prove that they're very nice. Okay, we are not gonna. So I'm only gonna pick up one property, which I'm gonna write on the board. I'm not gonna prove it. These in in a little bit. Z will spend some time giving you an idea of how to prove it. It's a very important thing. And then I'm going to deviate from there. Okay? So, but at least you have seen the proof that minimizers exist. And so I want to talk about density. So, yeah? Na naive question. I was a little bit lost. But, uh, we had this isoparametric model which was very nice, and then we went to the optimizers. And I'm sure there would be some connection, but, but somehow I got lost. You need to go to her talk. Well, because I'm about to, so I am about, so there, so the answer is no, we won't come back, but if you go to her talk, yes, we will come back, but might not be the answer you were looking for. So as I'm writing what I'm about to write, so what I'm about to write requires the ISO, is a property of minimizers for isoparametric. Um, the thing is that this technique that I use here for just perimeter minimizer, I could have used for you know minimizers with constraint, for sets that are approximating the isoparametric inequality for many things. And so that, that is another way to go back. But one of the ways to go back is by the proof of the following thing. So these are density estimates. for local perimeter minimizers. Because at this point, we've only shown that, you know, there's a set of locally finite perimeters, its boundary is rectifiable, but that doesn't tell us anything. So 
let me tell you what it says here is for n bigger or equal than 2. So this is only going to depend on the dimension. There exists a constant Cn positive such that V local perimeter minimizer I'm going to write something here at scale R0. OK, I haven't mentioned this, but R0 is going to show up in a second. What do I mean? I mean that E is a set that satisfies roughly this property, but only on balls that have radius less or equal than R0. So I don't care that you are not a perimeter minimizer of when you compare it on very large balls. I only care on small balls. R0 is a small number. OK? So at scale R0, then for every R less than R0, so just the ball over there had radius R0, is any ball of radius R0. And for every x that belongs to the boundary of E, we have two properties. One, and I'll draw the properties, 2 to the minus n. OK, and this is as far as my good intentions go. Remember, I had said that I was going to try to write ln, but I'm going to start writing lots of it, and so that adds more. So this is the Lebesgue measure of E intersection, the ball of center x and radius r. This is less than 1 minus 2 to the minus n. And 2. The perimeter measured of E in the ball of center x and radius r over r to the n minus 1 is less or equal than n, omega n. This particular number doesn't matter. This is the, me the Lebesgue measure, the n Lebesgue measure of, the, of B1. And here is a constant Cn. OK? Moreover, and h n minus 1 of the boundary of E minus the bound the reduced boundary is 0. I'm sorry about that. OK, let me draw the, I'm going to draw the theorem, OK? So what the theorem says is the following. You have a perimeter minimizer. And now, for every point, and what happens is that it's rather difficult to see what things can go wrong when all the pictures I can draw are smooth on the blackboard. And you know, it's, but what this is telling me is that if these were to be my perimeter minimizer, every is not. At, um, every time I take a point in the topological boundary, because remember, before we only needed that this number was positive and less than this number. But here it is telling us that it's quantitative, that really in each there is a big piece here and a big piece here. It's telling us that for the perimeter minimizer, you're not, you're not getting these horrible things. OK? So that doesn't happen, OK? Because here, yes, the measure of this side is positive, but it doesn't grow like r to the n. And it's telling us that when I measure the perimeter here, it really grows like r to the n minus 1. It could be that it's very small, or it could be that it's very, very big. OK? Give me a, I'm going to give you an example of very, very big. If, if I had a curve that starts doing like that, and like that, and like that, when, if you stand here, you know, this length gets very, very big. Well, that doesn't happen for a perimeter minimizer. OK. So this is only the beginning of the regularity of perimeter minimizers. But as I told you, all of these happen in the context of, I, of a class I was teaching what I wanted to talk about, perimeter minimizers. And what happens when I got here, 
and I stared at this. So, you know, I really focus on this piece. And I focus on the fact that here, that this measure, which is really Hn minus 1 supported on this, was going to look like Hn minus 1 supported on the boundary of E. Then <coughs> something came up. So notice this is telling me that the measure grows exactly like r to the n minus 1 with fixed constant. So this says, in a different language, <coughs> that the perimeter measure is Alfors regular. OK? So Alfors regular means that on small enough radius, a measure is Alfors regular. And if small enough uniform radius, the measure of the ball is like r to the n minus 1. OK? Or r to the d. But here, we're going to only have n minus 1. And why is that important? Because when people were trying to do harmonic analysis, on sets that were not simply Rn, but on other types of sets, one of the first conditions you have to put, not always, but a good condition to put, is that you live on a set where there is a measure that is Alfors regular. And from other work I had done, Alfors regular measures played a very important role. Um, why? Because I was looking at sets, so at sets of rough boundaries, where one, one of the few conditions I put on the boundaries was that the boundaries were Alfors regular. So that meant the surface measure to the boundary was Alfors regular. And what we were interested there was to understand how the solutions to, let's say, the Laplacian behave there. And uh, by that, I mean, how, how is the solution behaving as you're approaching the boundary. Inside, they're perfectly smooth. So I wanted to know what happens as you go to the boundary. And some of the work I had done initially with Koenig and then with other collaborators for years was very much focused on if you've taken a PDE class, the PDE class tells you, if you have the solution to the Laplacian on a nice domain, your solution is nice all the way to the boundary. Okay, and nice tends to mean C1 alpha and up. Okay, once you get to C1, things start going wrong. And then if you take a free boundary course, it tells you if the solutions of the PD, roughly speaking, I'm lying a tiny bit, but bear with me. If the solutions of the PD are nice all the way to the boundary, under some conditions, the boundary is nice. And again, nice all the way to the boundary has a meaning. And it tends to be at least C1 alpha. Okay? And so I, we were interested on, if I don't look at things that are as nice as that, okay? So let me give you an example. The solutions are, I, I said C1, but what if my boundary is not C1? What if my boundary is only Lipschitz? Everything that I say for C1 alpha breaks once you put Lipschitz. Actually, lots of them break when you put C1, but that's Lipschitz. And so we were very interested on basically classifying the regularity of a domain, even when regularity is understood on weird terms, in terms of the behavior of the solutions of the Laplacian at the boundary. OK, so that's what I had spent a lot of time. And this condition, not in this form, showed up often. And so when this condition showed up in the class, this is one of the times where you're teaching the class, and suddenly you're like, oh, wow, I can learn something from this class, which <laughs> is the best way. <laughs> um, then, then this is where things change. I mean, I, I taught the class the way I was supposed to tell the class, but here is what I started thinking. And so um, the homework for Z and for my student Max Gehring was to understand whether what I'm going to start doing was true. And this connected to the work of two other people. So now I'm changing gears. I'm going to define a class. And I'm going to talk. I know I have less time than expected, but we'll, we'll make do um, about joint work with the four of them. So. But, ever, but what I want to point out <laughs> is that, so the, no, 
the life takeaway, not the math takeaway of this story is the following. I mean, in my, so I, I did something for my PhD. The first time that my career took a big turn in a different mathematical direction was after sitting in a class that Carlos Koenig was teaching in something that I had never seen. And I asked a question that related that. I didn't know, but related what he was doing to something I had done before. And that's how, I mean, a new branch, I mean, lots of, <laughs> lots of mathematics had come out of that question, not only by us, but by a number of people. I'm not saying that this is a turning point the way that was a turning point, but this is an example of how, even when you're teaching the class on a subject that you think you learn, you know very, very well, you can find things that you had never seen before. Okay, so that was the life lesson. Okay, let me <laughs> so let me tell you who, what I'm going to talk about, and some of the things I'm going to have a chance to explain are actually rather classical. What we did is we just put them in a different context, and we show that it holds. I won't have time to present the the newer the newer part, but it doesn't matter. So the people are in alphabetical order. Boards, who is my current postdocs? Engelstein, who I met as a graduate student, but will be starting an assistant professor position. Gehring, who is my current grad student. And Zihui, who you have met, who was a student at the time. OK. And so the first thing we did is please keep in mind what we knew. We're about to define a funny class of objects. So we decided to start it studying. So I'm going to call CA a constant. So from now on, CA is a positive number. The A stands for alphas, OK? Yes, the mathematician. Alphas. And I take R0, a positive number. And I define the class A of CA R0 is the class of set of locally finite perimeter. I always, always, always choose the good representative. So the support of mu sub e is really the boundary. Sorry? What is the letter, the, the script letter? Uh... That's a very nice A. Very nice A. Yeah. And I want to say, <laughs> every time so every when I teach a, a measure theory class, this is my letter for the sigma algebra. And every single time I put it, somebody asks me, what is that thing that you put there? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's very clear. <laughs> it actually is very clear. As soon as you did that, I was like, good, sigma algebra. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't know it was an A. <laughs> it was an A. Well, the M is also a source of confusion. But it's an A. And I don't know why it's an A, but it's really pretty. OK. So I also ask, so what else do I ask about this? Whose perimeter measure? Satisfies. mu e of b of x r over r to the n minus 1 is bounded by c a, bounded below by c a minus 1. And then for every x that belongs to the boundary and for every r in 0, r 0. And these. I'm going to give you the name. This says, the definition is, this, this is saying, i.e., mu e, is our first regular. Oops, uh, to scale. Okay. 
And so what I'm gonna do, I realize I'm very short in time. I'm gonna write, so the first thing I want to do, I need to do, so what do I wanna do? So maybe let me use this time to explain what I wanna do. What happens in the perimeter minimizers afterwards? Had I gone that route, I wanna prove that the perimeter minimizers are nice. I take the point in the reduced boundary. I look at the place. Remember, I set the point in the reduced boundary is a point where the unit normal is a Lebesgue point. That means those. So I look at a point where the oscillation of the unit normal is small on a ball. And the way it happens, what happens afterwards, you do some things and something else, something else. And you're able to prove that in half of the ball, your boundary is a C1 alpha. Okay, so what we were interested here, what we're interested in here is looking, if I choose a point in here, in this boundary, where the oscillation of the unit normal is small, what can I say? Because there I use minimization a fair amount, but what can I say here? And I will be able to say, so I'm going to give you the punch drawing. This is what I'm going to finish tomorrow. Why am I saying today? So that you have, I'm going to be able to say that if on the ball of radius R2 R0, the oscillation of the unit normal is small, then on the ball of radius R0 over 64, <coughs> what I see is a large Lipschitz graph. So most of the ball is a Lipschitz graph with Lipschitz constant less than one, so beautiful. and then there's a small set that I know some things about it, but we won't talk about that, okay? So, um, so the first thing I'm gonna need to do in some sense, because of the way this works, is I need a compactness. You saw the importance of a compactness theorem. I need to know if this class is compact. Okay, so what does that mean? If I take a sequence of sets in here that are bounded in some sense, do I converge to a set in the same class? Okay, I'm gonna draw a picture. And then you give me the answer. So let me start with sets in here. So, this is a set in this class, correct? It's a set, so you can take it to go, um, if you want, you can close it, yeah, let's close it here. So this, this is a set in this class. Mm -hmm. The measure, the perimeter measured is really very bounded. I mean, in everywhere it is m less than four R. Okay, I'm gonna draw another one. I'm gonna draw another one. I'm gonna, sorry. And then I'm gonna let them, co okay? I have all of these, so what am I doing? I started with a cone, same length, it starts getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And what does this converge to? A line. So, of course, the set of finite perimeter I'm looking so that I have a set. You know, we can look at, you can look at the inside or the outside, whatever <coughs> you prefer. Let's look at the outside, so at least we didn't lose everything, okay? And you can imagine that we're putting this in a, in this rectangle here. So this satisfies the condition, this satisfies the condition, so, and then we get here. So the blackboard minus this line, it is a set of finite perimeter, okay? But there is a problem. This thing here, which was kind of the boundary of these, and was where the perimeter measure was supported. Now the perimeter measure is not supported here because remember the support <coughs> of the perimeter measure requires that I have the set and its complement and here I only have the set. So if I have a sequence of sets in there and I let them converge, they're not converging to a set in there, okay? So that's a problem. Oh, I have 15 more minutes, great. Um, so now I'm gonna prove a compactness result. So clearly my compactness result has to address these and clearly something not good is going on, okay? So, so you'll see in a minute what is the not good thing that's going on. Questions? Oh, 
Oh yeah, no, these are not minimizers. These, the minimizers are the thing of the past, okay? <laughs> Yep, if you had minimizers, it would be different, but no. So maybe this is a word of warning. It's also that when you realize that you maybe have done, you realize, oh, this applies somewhere else. You have to be very careful when you think, oh, and the following is true, that you have somehow not used, for example, the property of minimizers when you claim something like that, and then you have to scramble to figure out what, what really is happening. Okay, and I'm talking for exp from experience. Okay, so what's the compactness theorem? So it's not really a compactness theorem because compactness theorem tells you the thing you land into something that belongs to the same class and clearly something is going wrong. Okay. So but here is what we have. If E sub K <coughs> belongs to this lovely class, C A R zero, which choose all the all the point all the boundaries to contain zero Y because we don't want this C so when I anchor the sets, it's because I really wouldn't want something like this, okay? I have a ball, a ball, a ball, and it's going over where there, and then things fall. So, I mean, I put a point, and then that's the same for every k. There exists a subsequence. Subsequence. E and sub k. <laughs> and a set E, me, locally finite perimeter. And, and a radon measure. So this is not a vector value measure. This is really a measure, mu, such that three things happen. So the sets do converge. We know that when the sets converge, do we know? Yes, we know that when the sets converge, he talked about this last time, the sets converge, the measures, the vector valued measures converge weakly. But now, if we take the perimeter measures, the positive ones, well, they also converge weakly, but clearly, so let's go back to our example. <coughs> What's happening here? The sets are converging. The mu of E sub k converge weakly to mu of E, but in that case, this is 0, so it's useless. On the other hand, if I look at the, actually, let's do that exercise. If, <coughs> if we look at the perimeter, at the total variation, OK? And so this should say E and k. So that's the, that's the length here. The length here, what happens? Well, that measure is converging too weakly to this measure, OK? The measure, the Lebesgue measure here. So this is converging to another measure. The problem is that these and the total variation are not the same, OK? And it's not that I forgot that I need to do something. It's that they're not the same. What you know is that, as in the example, mu of v is less or equal than mu, and three things happen. <coughs> One, if x belongs to the boundary of e, there exists a sequence of points in the boundaries such that x and k converges to x. OK. Two, if x belongs to the support of mu, same thing happens. And if, now, kind of these two, and if you have a sequence x and k that belongs to e and k, and you know that the x and k is converged to x, then you know that x belongs to the support of mu. Okay, 
So let's see what on earth this says. This says that all the points in the boundary of the limit or on the support can be obtained from sequences. But if you have a sequence, so let's go here. Let's take a point in here. Okay, let's follow the finger. There's a sequence that converges. If there's a sequence that converges, that point is in the support. That is telling you that the boundary of E, which is the same thing as the support of mu of E, is included in the support of mu. OK? And as you saw, is the containment is strict. Here, the support of mu of E is empty, and the support of mu is my red line. And it's, that's what's happening. It's not like, oh, OK, it's, we're going to, yeah, that's the reality. So this class is not exactly compact, but is as close as it gets to compact. OK? So once again, I, I only have one compactness theorem. Questions? Actually, before I continue. Yeah. So for an example. Doesn't this scale R not stop us at some point? Yes. Uh, Can we go all the <coughs> Yeah. I, I am putting more conditions if I ask for more. So it's enough to do it locally. But when, <coughs> depending on what problem you are addressing, very often Alfred's regularity requires that the R naught goes all the way to the diameter of the set. But because here I only want local things, art not is small. OK. Anything else? Mm -hmm. it see, I'm having trouble. Maybe it's just that we're waving our hands a lot, but I'm having trouble seeing why the second line down there would be true. This guy? Yeah. Oh, we it have. It seems like you're making a jump from having two sides there to just having one side. Oh, yeah, but the. the so. This thing doesn't see the sides yeah. in some sense. On the other hand, it, let me, let's forget the little top of the ice cream cone for a second. OK, so let's see what's happening. Let's imagine you just have two planes so that we don't have to deal with this angle. OK? <coughs> and I have the Lebesgue measure here and the Lebesgue measure here. These are the positive measures I'm seeing. And the two planes are coming and coming and coming. So what am I approaching? What's the measure I'm approaching? I'm approaching the measure on a plane. But remember, this is measured against integration. You know, the way you do it is a constant. So what's really happening? You are getting Lebesgue measure, but you're counting, counting the Lebesgue measure twice. OK? So in this example, where you have the Lebesgue measure on these planes that are coming together, you're getting to the Lebesgue measure twice. So this one counts multiplicity. This one sees how you're turning on yourself. So let me give you the example there with the planes. Maybe that's a good example to look at. So what's the difference between a vector value measure and, <laughs> and its total variation? So that was a pathetic case, OK? You can be saying, oh, yeah, but there you kill the boundary. But what happens if you don't kill the boundary? But I still, it doesn't mean that. So it, it could be that you still have a, a nice boundary in some sense. Or let me do this picture a little bit better. So if I had my vector valued measure, one of it goes that way, the other one goes this way. So it's the unit normal in that direction times the Lebesgue measure, and the unit normal in this direction times the Lebesgue measure. Okay? As they start approaching, this unit normal cancels this one. Okay. Going to zero. On the other hand, well, you know, you're counting twice. Okay? That's what's happening. Okay. Any other questions? So I have a question. Say you don't put this condition that you put in this alpha. Yes, so 
what am I, I should have said, thank you. I'm missing the thing I'm about to write. Okay. <laughs> so all this is happening, if you just have Sorry. Time. No. Okay, I'll explain, okay, so. And mu is alpha's regular. Alpha's um, regular up to scale R0. Um, you are missing one of, you're also missing, um, and I have to think, you're missing one of Here, if you, if you think of it, what I get out of these two, okay? When I, when I stare at these two, I get that the, sup so sorry, if you've never heard what I'm about to say, just ignore me for three seconds. What you get here is that the support of the mesh of mu is the Hausdorff, the Hausdorff limit of the support of the previous measure. That's something else that you miss when you don't have, and that comes from the lower bound on the density. If you think of it, what I am saying here is that I have a uniform lower bound. So that's the place where things disappeared. Okay, but, so, so, but this says what you get when you have like boundary variation, right? If you, if you no, 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 that's, no, 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 that's, okay. I, I, I can't, yeah, no, in general, in the things that you might be concerned, you don't have a uniform lower bound, and then things can be disappearing. Okay, we can talk about it. But okay. I do, I always get this one. You know, I mean, mu. And you always get this one. So but then you don't know any. Huh? Uh, so the left, the left part of the board is true. No, no, without this. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So oh, okay. this, this box here is true. Okay? And, and I have to think for a second, so I am guessing this is what you lose, okay? Okay, wow. So let me, tell, let me see what I can tell. So there is only one thing, I have two minutes, there is only one thing, I'm gonna draw what I would like to say. So I only have one tool, the compactness theorem that I presented before, okay? It's not, I'm not. So for that, I need to do two things. My sets need to be inside a ball, and the perimeter has to be bounded in that ball. Okay. So my sets are not inside a <coughs> ball. So what am I gonna do? I look at my sets in the ball of radius two, my sets in the ball of radius four, my set in the ball of radius eight. And if I prove that on those balls, the perimeters are bounded, for each ball, for the first ball, I get a sequence. For the second ball, I get a, so if I, I get a subsequence. For the second ball, I use that subsequence and I get a further subsequence. And I do something that's called a diagonal argument and I can get the thing. So how do I get all the sets in balls? By cutting them with balls. That's not too complicated. <laughs> now, why are the perimeters uniformly bounded on a large ball? And I want to draw, I don't have time to prove it, give me a minute, and I draw the picture, okay? So here's the picture. This is my large ball. And I know that on small balls, Balls of radius R0, I'm not gonna do this so small, if not, I'm not gonna have time to walk through the thing. On small balls, for R0, my measure looks like R0 to the n minus one. So now the small balls I'm writing, they're of, I cover my set by balls of radius R0, center in the set, all the balls are of the same thing, okay, wow. They're all exactly the same radius, and I know that this measure is like R0 to the n minus one, because this is like R0. So I am on a ball of radius big R, and I cover 
I cover, if you want, boundary of E sub K intersection B of R by balls cover by balls of radius R0 such that they look like this. What does it mean? The center of this ball doesn't belong to this ball. Okay, so the centers are at a certain distance, and I know I'm running, I'm past my time. I'm going to let you kind of think about it. If you have questions, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend it into <laughs> what's going to happen afterwards. And then what you need to do, and I suggest maybe if Z doesn't mind, you start by counting how many balls of radius R0 do you need to cover the ball of radius big R when the, when the center of one ball is not in the other ball? And you find that there are only so many. And then you estimate all of these by the number of balls times the measure of each one of the balls. And that gives you uniformly bounded on each compact set. And that's how you can apply the, the compactness here. Okay, questions? Okay, so let me leave it here. Let me make one announcement. So Z is going to start two minutes ago. And <laughs> I mean, actually, I don't know. And then there's a mistake in the thing. Um, Toti's lecture is at 12.30 rather than... 11.30. 11.30, yes. It's at 11.30, not at lunchtime, okay? <laughs> okay, thank you.